Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to the Reliability Matters podcast. Thanks for being with me today. I'm Mike Conrad, your podcast host, and we are in beautiful, sunny San Diego, California for the IPC Apex Expo. My thanks to Trevor Galbraith for letting me um, interlope into his booth to do this podcast and our dynamic uh, production team, Summer and David and and a few other people that are making all the, uh, pushing all the buttons at all the right times, making this look as good as it possibly can. So, uh, and thank to, thanks to you all for uh, watching or listening uh, we're live um, coming from, uh, again, uh, Apex uh, in San Diego, and uh, this will also be available on demand afterwards on the Reliability Matters channel, and so just keep an eye out for that. If you missed the live, there's a second chance, but then again, you already know that if you're watching this. So today, I'm going to bring back probably the person that's been on my podcast more times than anybody else, my friend and colleague, Eric Camden from Foresight. Eric, good to see you, man. Hey, good to see you as always, Mike. Thanks for having me on the floor. Well, you're very welcome. Um, I love talking to Eric because uh, Eric is a failure analysis investigator uh, for Foresight. We'll get into what that means in a little bit. But he's like a CSI, like crime scene investigator, only instead of murders and burglaries and, you know, extortion and all the other things, the crimes are sins of the electronics process, breaking best best practices. Um, And I always like to say that when I uh, produce webinars with multiple speakers, uh, I'll have Eric as always as the last speaker. And, and I always say, if you don't listen to the first three speakers, you're going to meet Eric in, at your facility. Today is free. At your facility, it's not free. Far from it. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're with me today. Let's talk about reliability. And in our worlds, we share one common interest, and that is reliability um, generally has to do more with residue removal and contamination and things like that. That seems to be our field of expertise, although there are a million other things. Absolutely. That can affect reliability. We're, we play in the cleanliness sandbox, right? So tell me a little bit about Foresight. Um, you're a laboratory. What kind of work do you specialize in just so that we can put your frame of experience into perspective? Sure. Um, Foresight's been around a little more than 30 years now as well. It's kind of similar to the timeline that Aquis Technology came out. And at this point, I would say we're a good mix of failure analysis and process qualifications. So, you know, we always say it's cheaper and easier to do it up front, you know, to do all, get all your answers up front than try to chase down a failure at all with, uh, with recalls or something like that. So we've become a pretty, like I said, pretty much 50-50 mix of doing failure analysis and process qualification now. That could be, like you said, you know, send me, you know, a dead body of a printed circuit board, you know, that that was perfectly fine before it went into the field, and we can kind of look at what's left of it, and then we want to investigate exactly how we got there from here. So, um, you know, so we do a fair amount of that, you know, along with all the, the standard process qualification, you know, a lot of IPC qualifications with the new changes to, to Section 8 or J standard. You know, we're seeing more and more customers that are paying more attention to their cleanliness, and, you know, as you mentioned, that really is a, you know, a very important um, foundation when it comes to reliability. You know, reliability is not just one thing. It, it's it's becoming, you know, more of a master of many right. to, to get to that, you know, 20, 30 year warranty. Another thing that our companies have in common and you and I have in common is our view on the old cleanliness standard. Um, the old cleanliness standard, which was used for 30 plus of oh, 40 years, sure. probably close to 50 years. It was developed in the 70s, uh, used a uh, resistivity of solvent extract test, a bulk tester to test ionic, test for ionic species of residues on the assembly. And there was a magic number. These machines express cleanliness in micrograms of sodium per square inch. So, but the magic number was 10. If you're, if you're at 10 or below, ship it. Parts are great. If you're 10.01, Parts are dirty. Don't ship it. Or 1.56 if you're in the metric world. Um, we, for many years, said that's bogus, guys. That, how can you, how can you do 10? How can I tell you 10 if I don't know what your stuff does? And and I know your company, Foresight, 
develop their own criteria, not just bulk contamination, but 10 of what? Is it 10 of something that is, you know, weak organic acid, that's something that may or may not be as problematic as another um, residue species? It really matters what the contamination is. And you guys did a really good job at, through your experience in calculating and publishing internal standards, not recognized by any body, but, but based on your years and years and years of, of, of test results and anecdotal uh, experience, you were able to come up with your list of what numbers not to exceed based on specific residues. Right. You know, and much like, you know, we always said with the 1.56, you know, the historical acceptance criteria, you know, we have foresight recommended limits for ion chromatography, you know, allowable ions for uh, expecting good performance in the field. Now, but we will tell all of our customers, you know, loud and proud every time, you know, these aren't hard numbers that say, you know, if you are at 6.1 micrograms per square inch of chloride, specifically, you're going to have a failure. There are so many things you have to take into consideration the same way the IPC finally did um, with removing that number, you know, end-use environment, voltage, spacing, metallization. You know, there are so many different variables that have a uh, one-size-fits-all kind of number. You know, right. that's just something that, you know, was really never applicable to the electronics industry as a whole, you know. But e even within the one part, excuse me, the uh, the old standard, you know, if if it works for you, great. You've got, you know, historical objective evidence sure. that says we've used this for 30 years in our field service environment. You know, this number has been, you know, more than enough to be great. Keep using that number. You know, even the IPC is not saying don't use that number. Right. In fact, they're, they're saying, saying just verify. Opposite. Yeah. If, if you've been using it and you haven't had a specific type of failure related to those numbers and you haven't made any changes right. all this time, that's your objective evidence. Keep doing it. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, it's, so you're right. I mean, all the independent labs, you know, we generally have similar numbers for allowable ionics, but, you know, there's not one independent lab out there saying this is it. Hard, fast failure, absolutely, you know, if you're 1% above what we recommend for bromine, you know, for right. example. So, you know, it, it, it's really coming around. I think it, it's, I knew it was going to be like pulling hen's teeth. You know I mean? I knew when they pulled, you know, the, the, the one size fits all number out, I think the, the whole industry kind of, you know, stopped. You know, it, it, the world was right out because they had been doing something for so, for so long where they could just check a box and it was great. But now after a couple of years, so that was Rev H. Uh, Rev, excuse me, Rev G, that they removed that. Right. So we're on Rev H now. Yeah. And uh, all this past weekend, we were working on the J standard 001 task group. So, you know, it's going to go to its third rev of being out of that J standard. And I think what that's done is that's forced so many customers to look inward and say, okay, what do our numbers need to be? You know, now we have to, we've always built the IPC standards. Now section eight says, create your own numbers for how you're going to do process monitoring beyond the initial qualification using surface insulation resistance. Uh, you add the ionic element, and that's good for your process monitoring tool. Now you determine, 1.56, do I want to use ion chromatography? You know, there are other methods out there, sure. you know, to, to, to do a process monitoring, but those numbers have to mean something, and now you have to back it up. Right. I, I think what caused the industry to freak out is, A, as you said, they took away a number they've been using for 40 years, uh, and B, they didn't replace it with an alternate number. What do engineers want? Engineers, give me a number. I right. may not, it may be a hard number to hit, but just tell me where I need to be and we'll figure out a way to get there. Right. Right. Just, it's a goal. And now you're drawing your own line in the sand. And now the answer to, yeah, how clean is clean enough is, uh, to paraphrase it accurately, is it depends. Yeah. You tell me and show me how you came up with that number based on objective evidence. Right. So, the evidence. so going back to the original question you know, about foresight, you know, we're doing a lot more process qualification on new products now than we probably ever have in history since I've been there. You know, because there are customers saying, okay, what do we have to do to meet this, you know, specification that we can present the data to our customers? So, but that, that's a really a good thing. I mean, the, the whole, you know, the reason we're here, you know, specifically companies like yours and mine, you know, we, we're trying to improve reliability and performance for customers. You know, that's the bottom line. You're trying to clean them. I'm trying to right. prove that they're clean, you know, the, and, and the whole idea is just make more reliable product in the field. And I think now customers are really looking at that closer for their own individual process and not allowing an, a, an external source tell them, well, how clean they need to be when they really have no idea. Right. You and I, uh, well, Foresight, your company uh, produced a DOE, which we weren't, in, weren't involved in, but I loved that DOE. It was basically uh, you reflowed a bunch of uh, chess boards, dummy boards, uh, with you know real materials and, and dummy components, but real uh, simulated dummy components. And you intentionally, it was a no clean flux, and you intentionally ran 
various profiles slightly off, the slightly lower, and then a little bit lower, and then a little bit lower. All the way down to the parts fell off. All the way down to the <laughs> parts fell off, right. So take out where the parts fell off, because that would never make it out of the shop anyway. Um, and, and then you subjected those boards to ion chromatography, which is a process for the, my viewers or listeners that aren't aware, will will basically extract uh, samples of the residues and um, run them through analysis to identify what it is. Right. Fingerprints. Basically, it's the ion. Exactly. So you can tell if it's flux or if it's wash chemical or if it's certain types of ions and whatever. Um, and what you guys found was with no clean flux, which was the intent would be not to clean it, as the reflow temperature or the peak reflow temperature dropped very, a very minor amount from a percentage standpoint, one or two or three percent, the number of detectable harmful ions on the or ionic residues on the board rose. Some rather dramatically. Some were like 300 percent, 400 percent, 500 percent, 600 percent in some cases, uh, with just a few percent difference in reflow profile. We were so impressed by that study that we did a another study where we, instead of uh, basing the testing on uh, ionic residue, uh, on uh, ion chromatography, we wanted to do SIR testing, surface insulation resistance testing, on boards that went through the proper reflow temperature and then 2% lower, 2% lower, 1% or 2% lower still, and then simply subject them to SIR testing. And we wanted to do it that way because the new IPC Cleanliness right. testing standard says you gotta you gotta do SIR testing. So for 168 hours minimum. So it's okay, fine. We'll we'll do the IPC test. Um, we'll reflow a bunch of boards. We'll we'll run them all at various uh, profiles. Uh, none of, none of them which would affect solderability. They all look good. They all stayed on the part. Right. You would ship those otherwise. Couldn't see any difference. Right. But we just subject them to subjected them to um, SIR. And the boards that were reflowed at five percent. Lower, five percent, um, miserably failed SIR testing. By it wasn't close. It's not like one line dipped in, you know, below the red. Right, right. Half the thing was below the red. So that really, if I were an assembler, I would be incredibly alarmed by that, because if you are running a no clean flux and you're choosing not to clean it which is the preferred method, right? That's what it was intended sure. for. Um, although it's the number one flux being cleaned today, ironically. <laughs> which I have thought so. Intention yeah. would be, would be uh, yeah, the intention would be to not clean it. Uh, you're going to set up a, a, manuf a qualified process. You're going to, you know, make sure all your ducks are in a row. You're going to produce the best board you can. You're going to reflow it perfectly. You're going to, everything's going to be just like golden because you're going to pay a lot of attention to it. And then you're going to test it in, you know, with SIR, and it's going to come out as a high pass, as it should. And then you're going to go, oof, okay, we got our process. Now push the production button. And what happens over time? Yeah. Things process drift. Things drift. Processes change. Just even in a minor way. But if right. you're relying on, I don't need to do any testing because we did the qualifi qualification and everything was fine by a high standard, I never need to test again. All of a sudden, they're shipping product out the door that would have otherwise failed right they tested it but they're not testing it because they already did their test and they're just relying on kind of old data right they're not doing the the process monitoring right right and and that can come back to to bite them and i'm sure in your world correct me if i'm wrong but when you get a phone call or an email from a prospective client or an existing client that says we have a problem come out um how much of that is based on they thought they had a process that drifted and they didn't realize it drifted. Is is that kind of the, the primary driver of the category of problems? You've yes. Yeah. I would, I would say that that is one of the primary drivers where, you know, we've always done it like this. We haven't changed anything. And all of a sudden we're getting failures, you know, where we're testing things and they're failing miserably or they've got field returns. You know, then we go on site and we find that their maintenance records haven't been, you know, properly upheld, but they're not, more importantly, they're not doing the easy things like uh, doing thorough profile on their reflow, that they're not checking the amount of spray flux. You know, they, they see the program's the same, but they're not marrying that with what the equipment is actually doing. So, you know, when, when uh, we go on site and we, we look at equipment, 
you know, we start from incoming to final packaging for, for raw materials all the way up to final packaging the assemblies, you know, and we see, okay, where haven't you looked yet, you know? And there may be places that they've looked, but they don't realize that they're not using the right tool to look. You know, the, 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 going back to that first paper that, uh, that Foresight did with the, the ion chromatography looking at the lower um, temperature of reflow, you know, that was based on some customers that had some high thermal mass parts. And, you know, the, the end of that report, you know, I said, hey, put six thermal couples on your board and let's see exactly what, you know, you, what the, the profile looks like. You know, and we were seeing eight to 10 degrees difference in some spots on these really high thermal mass transformers or some, you know, parts like that. And, I, and then we saw the one-to-one -one with the ion chromatography data that says, okay, this saw less temperature. It still has the higher amounts of the, uh, the no clean flux activators that should have been properly outgassed if it saw the right temperature. You know, so there are so many customers that are using bare boards or, you know, non-fully populated boards to do thermal profiles for, you know, for SMT reflow, you know, and we say, hey, you know, this thermal loading is very important for all of your assemblies because this material per the manufacturer has to reach this temperature for X amount of time for it to become near benign as right. designed. You know, and, and like you were saying earlier, you know, even the ones that we knew would be, you know, failing SIR for, for the, the for the paper that we did together, you know, they look the same as the ones that were properly processed. You know, you, you can't inspect cleanliness. Right. You can inspect for visible residues, but you don't know if that's an active residue or not. Right. You don't know if it's harmful or, or right. whatever. Yeah. It, it's, um, I always tell people the problem with inspection, visual inspection is everything you see may not be harmful and everything you don't see might not be there. It, right. it could right. be there. Right? right. I mean, so it's, one should look. I agree. Sure. One should look. In fact, one of the reasons we, in our reasons for cleaning, when, when we, you know, talk about the reasons people clean beyond the poster child reasons of electrochemical migration and all that, one of them is to make it look pretty. Mm. And what's the importance? You know, dull solder joints, for example, are not an IPC defect. Right. Right. And dirt is not necessarily an IPC defect. The results of that could be, but the presence of it is not. Um, Cosmetic stuff is generally not considered a defect on its own. But what happens when they see, when a customer sees something that they don't expect to see? Then they look. Right. And when they look, they find. And I, I challenge any, the best board manufacturers, the best assemblers, if every board that you made was shipped to a customer and put under a you know 16X or whatever uh, and inspected, they're going to find something sure. that would otherwise be benign but they're going to find something they find offensive and they're going to reject it and send it back sure you don't want to give customers a reason to inspect correct how many times you've gone to a restaurant and your wine glass has a you know lipstick on it now all of a sudden you're looking at your spoon you're looking at the bottom of the plate right. you know now now you know you're now yeah. you're csi right, right. And you're yeah, totally exactly. csi yeah and you just don't want to give people the motivation to right you want them to open the box and assume everything is perfect the way they want it to be if you give them any reason to suspect it's not they will find something yeah and if you like you said if you look hard enough you know you can find it i mean it, it could be completely benign obviously you know but there are some customers who will see that and there are few reason few worse reasons to clean than visual inspection you know i mean it, right it, i don't need a shiny you know right. field return it doesn't make it a better field return like engineers you know, also say joints are shiny never rework something to make it look better right i mean that is it every time you expose it to some kind of rework process or or heat excursion or whatever you're yeah. now affecting reliability sure. by a measurable amount so right. it's like you never fix for cosmetics right you just let it go or either if you're embarrassed don't ship it <laughs> but if it's that bad sure that bad but otherwise knowing that it's not harmful it's just maybe a right. little dent in your reputation but it's not harmful right let it go so I, i've said for years that cleaning is kind of a go big or go home process and it's not often you hear me, well, let me back up a little bit. Maslow's theory was if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. If you're a cleaning guy, everything looks dirty. Right. You measure the whole world in, in terms of clean or dirty, sure. right? And clean is always bad in my world, or, or dirty is always bad. It's always bad. Non-clean is bad. Uh, but the only time you'll hear me say don't clean is if the alternative is to not clean well. Right, then you're better off just don't try it. Absolutely, it's go big, go home. Yep. Right, do it right or don't do it at all. Correct. Uh, you have an example of that. You and I were talking earlier off camera, sure. and you were telling me about a 
we'll keep the customer anonymous uh, to protect <laughs> to protect <laughs> but not so them, innocent, but not so to, to protect the guilty. Um, but what they did actually not maybe not the specifics, but what they did is very common. Um, but maybe not specifically that way, but right. why don't you share with, with me again and my audience sure. on that, that particular story? So, so I, was, I was recently at a customer's and we were working through some cleanliness issues and uh, we were using a localized test, uh, a piece of test equipment. And we, we tested these samples before clean. They wanted to do before and after clean to see, you know, how effective their, their uh, process was. Total, makes total sense. It's a great way to start collecting that objective evidence. Well, the... Uh, Dirty board, the, the as produced board was, you know, it failed in 40 some seconds. So I said, well, let's bring me the pump. I mean, we're totally expected, you know, with no clean flux, you know, you, you can have some, some dirty residues left over and then, you know, that's fine. You know, if it doesn't see the right temperature, we were just looking at, you know, baseline cleanliness. So they brought me some cleaned boards and it failed in 11 seconds. So they were actually making these boards dirtier. So I said, I said, okay, well, let, let me go look at your wash system. You know, we've got some experience with, with different types of wash systems. So I, uh, the engineer I was working with walks me over to uh, two batch cleaners, um, highest quality ones on the, on the market. I'll tell you that right now. So I'm, I'm looking at settings, and uh, all of a sudden I see behind the two batch washers, there is a table set up with two operators using uh, ESD brushes and sharing an IPA bottle top dispenser, and they're so they're dabbing, they're scrubbing the boards, and their rinse process was to hand them to a third operator who was using shop air just to blow them off. So, so yeah, they, they got the, oil on the board. This started, least. yeah, this started one heck of a conversation on on our front with me and the with the engineers I was working with and myself. I let them know, look, you know, improperly cleaning a no clean flux is just as bad, or you know, can be worse than leaving small pockets of water soluble behind. You know, the, the no clean flux, you know, everything's supposed to be bound within that outer well, resin shell. Encapsulated, yeah. Poor, poor man's conformal coat to some people, right. you know. Right. So uh, you have to make sure that if you're going to clean no clean flux, you have to remove, you have to solubilize everything and then do an effective job of rinsing. You know, they weren't rinsing at all. They were blowing the big chunks off with the shop air. And it, it was, you know, if it wasn't so sad, it'd be, you know, comical. I'm like, I, I don't understand who in this company thought this was a good idea. Um, what I was told was their high volume, low, or excuse me, high mix, low volume. So they that. would, they would have to have painted right. so long in between, you know, manufacturing the board and right. then going to wash that they, they thought that it made more sense to clean, you know, sooner, even though it was this subpar cleaning process right. compared to an automated system. Right. Well, they've since learned that that's not going to be the process going forward because they had no idea that they were actually making these boards dirtier than what they were before they started. So, you know, I mean... Customers don't always know what they're doing or, or have the right reason. You know, cleaning, no clean, we've discussed is, I still believe that it is a decision made from a C-level suite somewhere. Uh, somebody says, oh, it's no clean. So if we don't remove it all, it's no big deal. And if no clean means don't clean, right? I can't tell you how many uh, customers I've, I've talked to in the 37 years I've been doing this that... Um, think that if they're cleaning a no clean, they're doing something wrong. It's an admission of guilt. They're almost embarrassed. It's like, you're not supposed to clean it, but we can't figure out, you know, boards keep failing. So we have to do, so, you know, we're obviously doing something wrong, but we're not smart enough. So we, we they kind of, they're ashamed to admit they clean. Right. And a no, a flux manufacturer came to me after I was giving a lecture and usually they come up, they stand in line to talk to me and then they bitch and moan about me, like I'm, I'm calling this stuff no good. Right. And I'm, I'm not at all. Uh, no clean residue is as close to benign as you can get. The problem is if you don't clean it, you don't clean anything. It's right. in totality. So I make that clear. And I've been forgiven by most of them. But <laughs> one guy came up to me and he said, um, you know, the, the reason we call it no clean is no clean doesn't mean don't clean. It means it's the species of flux you would choose if you are not going to clean it. You wouldn't choose an organic acid. You wouldn't choose an RMA you'd choose no clean. It's just, this is what you use if you're not going to clean it. If you are going to clean it, you can still choose it, but it doesn't mean it's intended to not be cleaned. Right. The flux companies years ago realized people are cleaning their stuff. So, you know, they used to say it's not intended to be cleaned because it was hard to clean. Right. And they, they would say, don't try and clean it because we don't want the service calls, right? If it's not coming <laughs> off. Right. But I think there's a huge acknowledgement that 
I, I think from my per, uh, vantage point, most, that may not be totally accurate, but from my vantage point, most no cleans are removed. Um, I, I would say the vast majority. Our, our, we do polls, and you know our polls indicate about 53%, uh, but I'm sure, and that's North America. Overseas, different story. Overseas, they have you know iPhones. I don't think very very many parts of the iPhone are cleaned, but they right. can. They have this economy of scale that us mere mortals don't enjoy. They have this um, this um, ability to design to not clean. You know, you heard about design for manufacturability. They have design for non cleanability. They can design out things, and they can design their boards so that you get better outgassing under QFNs and things. They could do all the stuff that we wouldn't do. Right. So. But in, in the whole world, real quick, we only have two minutes left. Um, that went fast. That went really fast. Tell me about localized testing. You talked about localized extraction testing uh, sure. to evaluate cleanliness. Just give me a two-minute version of what that's actually uh, doing. Well, uh, no, many know, for, uh, I work for Foresight. You know, we have the C3 tester. Yeah. You know, but it really came out of a need to, uh, to serve our customers better because we were getting, you know, big, expensive backplane, server backplanes, and doing mechanical removal, you know, around the part that was failing. So, you know, it, as much as, you know, I believe in the C3, you know, I think one of the important things, and it has been pushed more and more here at the IPC, uh, the technical meetings, is the process of um, localized extractions being more valuable to a failure analysis, you know, and even a process qualification than a full board extraction. You know, that was one of the problems with the 2325, the ROSE test, or the 2328 ion chromatography test. You know, the, the, the basis was, you know, you're trying to uh, determine how much material you can remove, and then it averages out across the full surface area of the board. Well, if you've got one part that's really hard to clean, like a QFN, you know, QFNs are the magic component because you can't wash them, you can't process them with no clean. You know, they're not in a standoff height to get a uh, uh, solution underneath, and there's, you know, that's not tall enough to let everything out gas. So, you know, being able to determine how well you can clean the hardest to process parts, be it thermally or, or if you're doing a wash, you know, you have to use a localized extraction process to determine how clean that is. And, and you know, through some, you know, common sense, you can say, okay, if I'm cleaning these, if these are good, everything else on my board should be good. So, you know, that's one of the things that, that I think we've been pushing, you know, through the IPC for a while. And it's not just, you know, Foresight, you know, there are a lot of other companies working on the ion chromatography task group. Yeah. Oh, I like uh, it. I think it's a, it's a great compliment to... Um, if I look at it as like a police work, if someone robs a bank, they set up a perimeter and and they start really canvassing the area within that perimeter. Right. Exactly. It doesn't make sense to go to another state and start Correct. canvassing. Absolutely. Yeah. And bulk row testers, they serve their purpose. You can't do it all with local. You can't do it all with Correct. Like bulk. Bulk searches the entire board. doesn't tell you what it is or where it is. Right. It just says, yeah. Something's higher. It's the perfect tool for process monitoring yep. as it was manufactured exactly. to be. But if back you got out where it is, <laughs> exactly. Right. Back when people were listening to David Bowie on their sure. track tape. Sure. You know, Diamond Dogs come, going to work. Um, and with David Bowie, we'll let that be our <laughs> our segue, hard segue out. Uh, Eric, thank you so much Absolutely. for being right, my, my guest today. You're always a thrill to talk to. Um, we have these same conversations in bars. Uh, I, I have to say, you know, it's just without the cigars and the and the drinks, but we, we just talk about cleaning. We're cleaning nerds. So thank you to my audience. We don't talk about cleaning very often on this show, but um, uh, when I get a chance to, I always love it. Uh, be sure and, and subscribe to the podcast uh, so you don't miss an episode. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever, um, be sure and subscribe and like. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, or if you want to watch this on our YouTube channel, what? We have a YouTube channel? Yes, we do. Uh, be sure and click the subscribe button and the bell icon so you can be notified when new episodes are released. Thanks again for watching. If you're watching this live, thanks for uh, being there. If you're watching this uh, sometime in March uh, on my regular channels, uh, I'll see you again in two weeks. So uh, again, thanks, Eric. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.